morning, everybody. All right, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dean, for uh, the warm introduction. Thank you, everyone, for making the time to join us this morning in person uh, as well as online. I'm loving the energy in this room, in this space right now. It's truly an honor to be talking with you this morning uh, in such a uh, inspiring space, inspiring atmosphere, considering the rich history, legacy of the Community Church of Boston. Um, it's truly a privilege, especially considering the speakers uh, who have been associated uh, with this institution, from Martin Luther King Jr. to Thurgood Marshall, Rosa Parks, Angela Davis, and of course, the one and only W.E.B. Du Bois, as uh, Dean said, who actually celebrated a birthday recently, Du Bois's birthday, February 23rd. So I think if my math is correct, he would have been 124 years old. Um, I went into history, that's why I, I, I don't do math. Uh, but Du Bois, a remarkable legacy. Um, and that's what I want to talk about uh, this morning. Um, but we might be well within our right to ask what can be said about W.E.B. Du Bois, the greatest black scholar activist in American history that has not been said already. We know that he lived an incredible life, 95 years. He was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts in 1868, died in Accra, Ghana in 1963, literally the day before the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, 95 years. And he was the first African American to receive a PhD from Harvard University that he wrote an astonishing 22 single authored books. 22 books, right, across a range of disciplines, many of them considered classics today. Hopefully you have read The Souls of Black Folk, published in 1903. If you haven't, make sure after this event is over you get your copy. Um, he was one of the founders of the modern civil rights movement. He offered his thoughts on nearly every issue facing black people in the United States and throughout the African diaspora, that he's been the focus of literally a mountain of books, right? So what else could we possibly learn about W.B. Du Bois that hasn't been put out there already? This is certainly what I was thinking way back in October of 2000, when I just started research on my dissertation uh, on African-American soldiers in World War I, which would become my first book, Torchbearers of Democracy. I was visiting the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where the majority of Du Bois' papers are archived. And I had, in advance, gone through the finding aid, and I saw this curious reference to Du Bois' World War I materials. I right? literally didn't know what it was, had no idea, but I was certainly very intrigued. So I go to the library, ask the librarian, reference, uh, librarian, can I see this Du Bois World War I materials? Right? My expectations certainly weren't high. The archivist returns with six microfilm reels. Okay, I don't know if you're familiar with microfilm. These are these tapes of materials, right? You have to load them into this kind of old funky m machine. So I load the first reel, advance it, and very surprisingly, this is what I saw. Now, what was I looking at? As I dug into these materials further, I realized that I was looking at the table of contents of an 800-page manuscript by W.E. Du Bois on the black experience in World War I that he never finished and that remained unpublished. An unfinished and unpublished manuscript by Du Bois on the black experience in World War I. In addition to this manuscript, all of Du Bois's research materials and all his correspondence related to this project, this book, which had this remarkably evocative title, The Black Man and the Wounded World. The Black Man and the Wounded World. So imagine, I'm a graduate student, right? And I just literally stumble upon an unfinished and unpublished manuscript by the great W.E.B. Du Bois. I was shocked, thrilled, overwhelmed, and in all honesty, very confused. I had so many questions. What was this book? Why did I not know anything about it? Why did Du Bois write it? How long did he work on it? Why was it ultimately unfinished and not published? And why was this book even important? So the story surrounding this forgotten book is truly remarkable. 
It's a story about the challenges of being African American. It's a story about race and democracy, about history and memory. It's a story about hope, right? as well as disillusionment, faith and tragedy, determination and failure. It's a story of Du Bois in all of his brilliance and all of his flaws, wrestling with the catastrophe of war, its legacies, and the resulting historical and personal wounds. This is the story that I tell in my book, The Wounded World, W.E.B. Du Bois and the First World War. Now, there's obviously a lot to say about Du Bois, a lot that we could talk about, especially in terms of his background, his very long history. I'm happy to answer any specific questions in the course of our uh, conversation. But my story really begins in 1914, at the start of the First World War, the Great War, as it was being described at the time. Du Bois considered himself a pacifist, at least philosophically. He pinpointed the origins of the war in the competition amongst the European belligerents for imperial control of Africa and its people. However, Du Bois ultimately believed that the best hopes for democracy hinged on victory by the Allies over Germany. So when Woodrow Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson, addressed Congress on April the 2nd, 1917, and declared war on Germany, Du Bois made the fateful decision to abandon his pacifist principles and support the United States entering the conflict. He argued that it presented an opportunity for African Americans to stake claim to their citizenship and bring meaning to Wilson's claim that the world must be made safe for democracy. Black people had fought in the past, and now they would do so again, Du Bois believed, with hopes that the two warring ideals of being black and being American that Du Bois famously articulated in the souls of black folk would at last be reconciled. So Du Bois threw himself into the war effort, encouraging African Americans as soldiers as well as civilians to demonstrate their loyalty on and off of the battlefield. But white supremacy severely tested his patriotism. Along with other African Americans, he had to reckon with moments like the horrific East St. Louis pogrom, July of 1917, which left hundreds of black people dead. But Du Bois' biggest test came when he published Close Ranks in the July 1918 issue of The Crisis. The Great War represented the crisis of the world, Du Bois began. He argued that however distant the war seemed, black people had, in his words, no ordinary interest in the outcome. For this reason, African Americans had to make their allegiances clear. Let us, while this war lasts, forget our special grievances, forget our special grievances, and close our ranks shoulder to shoulder with our own white fellow citizens and the allied nations that are fighting for democracy. We make no ordinary sacrifice, Du Bois wrote, but we make it gladly and willingly with our eyes lifted to the hills. And I'm more than happy to talk about some of the behind the scenes things that were happening as Du Bois was writing this editorial. But the most important point to emphasize is the reaction that African Americans across the country had to Du Bois writing this incredibly controversial piece. Close ranks unleashed a firestorm of controversy. The Boston civil rights activist and one time ally of Du Bois co-founded the Niagara Movement with Du Bois, William Monroe Trotter, labeled his former friend, among many insults, a rank quitter of the fight for rights. Called Du Bois a rank quitter of the fight for rights. From coast to coast, many African Americans branded Du Bois as self-serving, at best and at worst, a traitor to the race. For a man who had committed his life to the cause of freedom and justice for black people, no charge could be more stinging. The uproar and damage to his radical credentials left Du Bois deeply wounded. 
So as the war neared, this is the end of the war neared, excuse me, Du Bois, his credibility tattered, his leadership in question sat in arguably the most precarious position of his otherwise illustrious career. Then quite unexpectedly, an opportunity presented itself. At the October 1918 Board of Directors meeting, the NAACP proposed that Du Bois spearhead production of a book on the history of the black experience in the war. He leapt at the opportunity. The scholar in Du Bois was intrigued, but more importantly, here was a chance for redemption. He began work on the book and ultimately set his sights on France, where, as he would later write, the destinies of mankind center. On December the 1st, 1918, Du Bois departed from Hoboken, New Jersey, as part of the official press delegation accompanying Pre President Woodrow Wilson to the peace conference at Versailles. Du Bois would spend three incredible months in France. He organized a landmark Pan-African Congress in February of 1919. His principal mission, as he described it, however, was to conduct research for the NAACP war history. He toured the battlefields, seeing with his own eyes the incomprehensible devastation of the war. He literally stood in the trenches. Most importantly, he talked with black soldiers and officers who made up approximately 380,000 of the U.S. Army's total number of troops in the war. With military intelligence following his every move, Du Bois absorbed tale after tale of institutionalized racism, discrimination, slander, and abuse inflicted upon black servicemen during their time in France. Never in my life have I heard such an astounding series of stories Du Bois wrote from France in a January 1919 letter to his NAACP colleagues. He knew what needed to be done. I can say solemnly and without hesitation, he wrote, the greatest and most pressing and most important work for the NAACP is the collection, writing, and publication of the history of the Negro troops in France. Du Bois returned to the United States, enraged, embarrassed, and determined. He channeled his frustrations along with the anguish of African American servicemen he encountered in France into the post-war issues of the crisis, and especially the May 1919 issue where, in the editorial, returning soldiers, he declared, we return, we return from fighting, we return fighting. History would be Du Bois's central battlefront in the struggle over the meaning of the war and redeeming the legacy of black contribution to the Allied victory. He encouraged readers of the crisis and black soldiers in particular to, in Du Bois's words, help in the compilation of his book, letters, diaries, Photographs, official military documents, and personal memoirs quickly flooded Du Bois' office. Du Bois promised that his book, which he tentatively titled The Negro in the Revolution of the 20th Century, would appear by the fall of 1919. But Du Bois' faith in the revolutionary potential of the war was severely tested throughout the summer of 1919. From Washington, D.C., to Chicago, to Phillips County, Arkansas, race riots and full-scale massacres exploded throughout the country. The number of lynchings skyrocketed, which included many black veterans, some still in their uniforms. James Weldon Johnson, famous civil rights activist, artist, and close friend of Du Bois, labeled these bloody months the Red Summer, the Red Summer of 1919, the horror of the summer stunned Du Bois. As he wrote in his book, Dark Water, which he completed amidst the tumult and disillusionment of 1919, how great a failure and a failure in what does the World War betoken? A remarkable question for Du Bois to ask in 1920, just a year after the war had finished. How great a failure and a failure in what 
does the World War betoken? Du Bois set out to answer this question. He committed himself to writing. He devoted significant time throughout much of 1920 and into 1922, staying up sometimes late into the night. He usually went to bed at 10 p.m. He even stayed up past his usual bedtime, drafting several potential chapters for what he confidently believed would be the definitive history of the black experience in the war. Du Bois's early chapter drafts reflected an attempt to try and find redemptive value in the global catastrophe and his own place in it. But his disillusionment with the war continued to deepen. The worsening conditions facing African Americans and other peoples of African descent throughout the diaspora caused him to further struggle with the war's individual and collective meaning. And then there was also personal tragedy. On January the 8th, 1922, Du Bois lost his closest black friend and the man who best embodied the quest to reconcile race and country, Colonel Charles Young. Young was the highest ranking black officer in the army and black America's military hero. He was like Colin Powell before there was Colin Powell. Right? He had been unjustly retired from active service during the war for dubious health reasons, really to prevent him from becoming a general. It literally broke his heart. The Army very conveniently reinstated Young after the armistice and assigned him to Liberia in Africa. While on a mission in Nigeria, he became gravely ill and died in a British hospital in Lagos. Over a year after his death, Young's body was finally returned to the United States and buried with full honors in Arlington National Cemetery. But Du Bois could not forgive the government, his government, for what Du Bois characterized in his words, the inexcusable crime of denying his friend the opportunity to serve in France, yet sending him to Africa to die. Such ugly reminders of the war's legacy further validated Du Bois's new title for his book, The Black Man and the Wounded World. As the title reflected, Du Bois' initial hopes of the war as a potentially revolutionary moment in the reconstruction of global race relations had evolved to an interpretation of the conflict as one of the darkest moments in modern world history. The war was a global tragedy that along with laying the seeds for future war, strengthened white supremacy and furthered the economic exploitation of peoples of African descent. No surprise then that he described the war in the opening chapter of his book manuscript as a scourge, an evil, a retrogression to barbarism, a waste, a wholesale murder. Du Bois's public announcement in 1924 of the black man and the wounded world sparked renewed public interest in his book. Encouraged, he began writing again. By 1926, he had drafted the bulk of his envisioned chapters for the book, and it finally seemed on the verge of completion. But Du Bois' guilt about his decision to support the war continued to gnaw at him. In a 1930 letter to the editor of the magazine The World Tomorrow, Du Bois very surprisingly admitted that he was ashamed of my own lack of foresight and that, quote, instead of a war to end war or a war to save democracy, we found ourselves during and after the war descending to the meanest and most sordid of selfish actions, and we find ourselves today nearer moral bankruptcy than we were in 1914. By the mid-1930s, Du Bois' politics had moved further to the left, and he began to envision his book began to envision the black man and the wounded world as an explicit lesson about the horrors of modern warfare. Italy's 1935 invasion of Ethiopia added even more urgency to his book as he saw the same racist, unchecked thirst for empire that led to the First World War laying the groundwork for an even greater disaster in the near future. And interesting fact. On January the 12th, 
1936, Du Bois delivered an address at the Community Church of Boston titled, The Italian Ethiopian Situation, Its Relation to the Black People in Africa. A trip around the world later that year, in 1936, brought even greater clarity to the book's new significance. Du Bois would spend seven months abroad in 1936. First, he visited Germany, seeing up close Hitler and the Third Reich, interestingly enough, during the 1936 Summer Olympics. He then traveled through the Soviet Union, visited Manchukuo, spent time in China, and finally spent several days in Imperial Japan. He returned to the United States in December of 1936, having seen firsthand the seeds of the next World War. As the boys saw it, time was running out. The need for his book could not have been more urgent. He wanted people to see that the still open wounds from the last World War promised an even greater disaster in the future. With a sense of desperation, he applied for funding support. But as had largely been the case with all of his other earlier requests, he was rejected. The global nightmares Du Bois predicted soon came true. In July of 1937, Japan and China went to war. Hitler's ambition, aggression, and flagrant disregard of the international order built out of the First World War increased, culminating in the September 1st, 1939 invasion of Poland. By 1940, just as Hitler prepared for the German army to invade France, Du Bois, disillusioned, disheartened, with a Second World War, a tragic reality, abandoned hope that he would finish and publish his book. Despite an investment of more than 20 years, despite a manuscript over 800 pages in length, The Black Man and the Wounded World, Du Bois' epic history of the black experience in the First World War would never see the light of day. So, you may be asking, why didn't Du Bois finish his book? Why didn't he finish The Black Man and the Wounded World? As I argue in my book, Du Bois suffered from what we could think of as a type of intellectual shell shock when it came to writing about and rationalizing a war defined by its irrationality. In his semi-autobiographical 1940 book, Dusk of Dawn, he wrote, in my effort to reconstruct in memory my thought and the fight of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People during the World War, I have difficulty in thinking clearly. Du Bois, difficulty in thinking clearly? That doesn't sound right. Even up to the final years of his life, Du Bois still sought to understand why he had supported the war in the first place. I felt for a moment as the war progressed that I could be without reservation a patriotic American. Du Bois, by this time in his 80s, wrote in an autobiography that was posthumously published in 1968. I'm not sure that I was right, but, um, but certainly my intentions were. I did not believe in war, but I thought that in a fight with America against militarism and for democracy, we would be fighting for the emancipation of the Negro race. With the armistice came disillusion. That disillusion stayed with the boys until his death on August 27, 1963 in Accra, Ghana. The war consumed the boys. It confounded him. He could not make sense of it, both on a personal and on a historical level. He was able, unable to muster the intellectual fortitude, the intellectual clarity, and dare I even say the moral strength necessary to complete his book. His failure embodied the tragedy and failure of the war he struggled to write about. In this sense, the black man in the wounded world was Du Bois himself. So why does this story matter? It matters because Du Bois matters. 
He remains arguably the greatest black intellectual this country has ever produced. And, as I talk about in my book, right, it's important that we reckon with him, that we try and understand him anew by acknowledging the importance of World War I in his life and his work. Moreover, just as we rightly celebrate his genius, we must also understand his humanity. Someone who hoped, someone who dreamed, someone capable of even making the wrong decision, and someone even capable of failure. But also someone who changed. The failure of World War I, and ultimately the failure to complete the black man and the wounded world, were essential to Du Bois's political evolution, his radicalism, and perhaps most importantly, his commitment to peace. By the late 1940s, he became a staunch peace activist, and in the eyes of the federal government, in the midst of the Cold War Red Scare, a distinct threat. This was the title of a speech Du Bois delivered at the Community Church of Boston on November 11th, 1951. The timing of this speech is remarkable because that same month, Du Bois was indicted and tried on charges of being an agent of a foreign principal for his peace activities. He ultimately won an acquittal, but the ordeal and subsequent seizure of his passport by the government were a painful reminder that for a black person commit, uh, criticizing America and fighting for peace came with tremendous risk and cost. In his book titled In Battle for Peace, oops, I'm sorry, go the wrong way. Published in 1952, Du Bois wrote, as then a citizen of the world, as well as a citizen of the United States, I claim the right to know and think and tell the truth as I see it. Du Bois said, I believe in socialism as well as democracy. Above all else, he wrote, I hate war. In trying to write and complete his book, Du Bois asked and confronted a profound question. What did it mean to live in a wounded world? A world wounded by racism, by empire, by economic greed, by reckless nationalism, a world wounded by war. This was not simply a historical question. In Du Bois' mind, the future of the world itself hinged on providing the answers. And it is a question that still haunts us today. What does it mean to live in a wounded world? Looking at and taking seriously Du Bois' long, complicated relationship to the history and legacy of the First World War certainly matters to how we understand Du Bois, his life, his work, his evolution. It certainly matters to how we understand the war itself and how it shaped the 20th century world. But it also matters to how we understand our 21st century world and our own obligations as historians, as citizens, as human beings. Du Bois knew that his work did not exist in a vacuum and that it had to speak to the pressing issues facing people of African descent and all oppressed peoples throughout the globe. More than a century after the First World War, many of the same struggles Du Bois confronted, systemic racial social and economic inequality, fascist authoritarianism, the willful distortion of an attempted erasure of black history, attacks on democracy, war, and preparation for endless war. All of these remain urgent matters today. Though we may not have completed one of his most important books, Du Bois reminds us of the work still left unfinished and our responsibility to use our knowledge and our convictions to help heal our still wounded world.